What's going on guys? It's Justin here from Summit Racing and uh, we're here in the Babcock studio with uh, Tomorrow's Technicians to uh, talk about steering parts. So thanks for having me, Andrew. Uh, what's going on with you? Well, thanks for coming, Justin. This is going to be an interesting topic. I know for, um, you know, everybody's getting ready for their ASC exams and this is the ASC A4 and steering takes up 12 questions of the total 40. But the neat thing about steering, I think it's one of these future-proofed items on a vehicle you're always going to have to deal with, especially if you're dealing with electric vehicles too. So this is a very pertinent topic and, you know, I guess we should probably start at the beginning. Um, hydraulic and how it started on a lot of vehicles. Yeah, I mean, so in some of the first automobiles, like, you know, so we'll kind of just start the progression of automotive technology, you know, back in Henry Ford's day. Power steering wasn't a thing. It didn't exist. So all your power steering was right here. And they compensated that a lot in automobiles with large oversized steering wheels. So if you look in, um, you know, some old, older vintage automobiles all the way up through the 30s and even some of the early like semis, you'll notice that the steering wheel is, is this big and steering wheels don't really start to shrink in cars until, the, you know, the, the mid 60s up into the 70s when power steering became really prominent. And, you know, one of the go-to kind of ste power steering setups is that those old Saginaw units, you know, between Saginaw yep. steering boxes and ty them type 1 and 2 pumps. So, i just like to put an advisement out for our uh, instructors out there in the audience listening. For the first 10 questions submitted um, on the YouTube channel, you'll each be receiving a $20 Summit Racing gift card. So, keep that in mind. Keep the questions coming. Uh, ask them as they occur to you. Um, and we'll just keep an eye on those questions uh, throughout the whole uh, thing. I'd also like to say thank you to um, uh, Jack Stowe at North Kansas City Schools, the SeaTac program. Hey guys, how you doing out there? There they are, live in the classroom. Thank you for joining us, and we'll have questions periodically throughout the whole event from those guys. Um, so let's get back to that history. You're right, the steering wheels, 15 inches. I mean. I think a 15-inch steering wheel at Summit Racing right now would be something for like a, a hobby stock car. Um, yeah, so that's what in like racing applications, so a lot of guys still run either steering quickeners or, you know, you run direct steering through like a manual rack. So you need to have that mechanical advantage. So you can't drive a car with no power steering or a race car with no power steering with an 8-inch steering wheel. So you kind of need that 15-inch guy. I've, I know I had a, a car at one point that had like an 8-inch steering wheel in it, and you could drive the thing with handcuffs on. It was, it was kind of neat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I remember back in my days, my first car, Pontiac Fiero, that had no power steering. And it was kind of difficult to drive at low speeds because they didn't figure out yet how to do electric power steering yet. You had, those long lines from the back to the front if you're going to have power steering that really wasn't feasible back then. Yeah and that's the cool part about modern technology and automobiles it's you know you you should only with steering you should only think that you know there's only so many ways you can skin that cat and there's not really a lot to improve on it but modern automobiles they've took hydraulic steering completely out of the vehicle and came up with electronic power steering units and power racks. So we have a couple actually sitting here in front of us this one's out of, I believe this out of a Ford F-150. Yep. So this is a, a modern Ford power steering rack. You know, it has an electric motor on it. It's, it's just like a, your conventional one, but instead of having a hydraulic feed and all that, they've added an electric motor to it, and it controls it through a wheel angle sensor in your steering wheel. So they've added some more components to it and took a little a bit of the simplicity out of the steering units, but as with all technology, that, that's what happens. And a lot of these units, um, you know, it's it's connected to the entire vehicle. Everything from the throttle by wire to the speed sensors in the transmission, just to make sure that that steering has the correct feel and the amount of assist. Yeah, and it's super cool how, how Andrew just said how that works. So, you know, if I'm doing 80 miles an hour down the highway, I'm not getting the same steering response that I do if I'm doing 15 miles an hour and low speed around town. So the vehicles have kind of smartened up a bit and they, uh, they can identify, you know, your driving style and how you're driving and the steering you know, adjust accordingly. And just as a reminder, Nadine put this up here, make sure that you're also including um, your email address with the question and what school you're going to um, if you don't put your email address here because we can track it down through there, through the Tomorrow's Technician uh, magazine and website. Um, <clears throat> You know, and just the, the diagnostics on these is pretty important. Um, but as far as, you know, 
um, you know, let's say this application for a hot rod. Is Summit Racing making anything that could retrofit electric power steering units? So that is something cool that, you know, the electric power steering units have brought to the market being in, you know, coming from OE vehicles, like it's big in GM and, and Toyota. A lot of those cars use electronic power steering units now. So companies like Flaming River and ePass Performance have took these units and made it to where you can retrofit these in some of your older cars. So Mustangs, Camaros, Chevelles, basically anything you can think of, you can retrofit one of these power steering units into. Now, if you have a weird application that you're not sure about, the cool part about some of these units is you can take one right out of like your local pick and pull and you can retrofit this into your application. Now, there might be a little more work involved in figuring out there, but it's totally able to be done. Now, for you guys that like me, that you know, time is money and I go into the pick and pull all the time, doesn't really do it for me, I can go walk right into Summit Racing and buy something from ePass or Flaming River that is almost a direct bolt into my car because they've made the conversion brackets already, they've done the wiring for us, they've took all the headache out of it. So that's really cool. You know, there's something for every foot to fit. You know, there's you know, not every shoe is universal. So depending on what you're trying to do and how much money you're trying to spend or you know, how wild you're trying to get, there's something for everybody in an electronic power steering conversion. And, you know, it's endless. I mean, everything from a, a Ford Thunderbird 1957 that didn't really have electric power, or power steering on, the, on those ones. I mean, you really look at, you know, we mentioned before, the size of the wheel. It also came down to the alignment on the vehicle. I mean, you look at the caster figures for some of these vehicles, it's pretty big. And the amount of, of uh, uh, camber was almost like nothing, almost straight up and down, just to make the wheels easier to turn. But then you look at the tires back then. Yes, and that's another crazy part that's developed, you know, with steering components as well as tire technology. You know, we used to drive on, you know, everywhere on belt, you know, belted radial tires and, and that kind of deal, or belted tires. And um, that is, uh, it doesn't quite handle the same as your conventional tires of the day. Like, tire technology has progressed just as much as steering has. And even think about everybody used to run 15-inch wheels in a tire with a giant sidewall. Now most of your modern automobiles have 18s, 20s, 22s, and a rubber band, no sidewall tire, you know, with more wheel, it's more weight. Yeah. And it's a lot of friction on pavement to move around, especially at low speeds. Mm -hmm. Hey, we got a good question here. I kind of like this one from Aaron Hicks. Uh, which vehicle used the first electric power steering system? Ooh, that's a good question. And I, I don't want to put my foot in my mouth by giving you the wrong uh, answer, but I know for me, for vehicles that I saw a lot of, was the Saturn Views Cobalts, and that was, as a technician, those were some of the first vehicles that I had encountered with electronic power steering. So G the Pontiac G6s as well. Actually, I have a funny story about that. <laughs> I, um, I had a, a, a buddy's girlfriend's car, and I was doing um, some maintenance to it, and that's what she told, you know, she's like, oh, I was like, oh, I'll check all the fluids, that. And she says, yeah, my car doesn't have power steering. I'm like, you're crazy, what do you mean? She's like, yeah, when I check, went to go check my own fluids, it doesn't have a power steering fluid cap under the hood, and I'm like, you know, okay, sure, da 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 I go to work on the car and I service it, and uh, sure enough, that's when I found my first electronic power steering unit <laughs> under the dash. <laughs> and it was cool, like I said, I was dumbfounded. I was like, oh, she was right. Like, um, I'm, I'm the crazy one. <clears throat> I'm going to take a stab at this. I know I'm going to be wrong, Aaron, with this, but I'm going to be betting on either it was Porsche or Ferrari that had the first uh, electric power steering system, and those were actually... Gosh, I'm trying to remember the company that did those, but they're uh, electro-hydraulic. So basically you had a motor powering a power steering pump, and then that one, um, the hydraulic pressure powered the rack back and forth. Kind of, it's, it's basically the Nissan system with the electro-hydraulic uh, power steering. Those were some of the first kind of true electric ones that weren't connected to a pump, connected to the engine. Yeah, and that's something we should get into too. When you you know you mentioned hydraulic steering, we should kind of give them a you know an overview of the basic uh, where this all started with power steering and you know how your basic hydraulic power steering operates because when you're trying to take this AAC, this ASC A4 exam list, like that's that's a huge part of it. So kind of just the general understanding of how a hydraulic system works. Let's pull up that initial picture of the hydraulic power steering rack, Ashley. Bingo. I think this one is from either a Mercedes, but it pretty much represents everything that's a lot out there with a hydraulic power steering system, especially with a rack. 
So the basis of your system is going to be the hydraulic pump itself. It's what makes the pressure, and that's, that's the heart of the system. That's what pumps the blood. So from that, you have a high pressure and a low pressure line. Your high pressure line is where your pressure, your fluid's made, and that's what's going to control you know, your power steering. So then to your rack, where your steering shaft connects, you'll see where kind of the lines go in, and that's where your actual orbital control is. So a steering orbital, what it's going to do is it's going to direct the power steering fluid to where it needs to go to give you power steering, essentially. So with that orbital, you're referring to either a <clears throat> control valve or a spool valve. Yep. On those. Um, and the more torque or tension that you put on those, the more fluid that can flow to the either side of the rack to move it either way. Yeah, it's kind of cool. They're, they're almost variable. And, you know, GM even had a cool design in the early 90s with their pickup trucks. That's, they called it, it was the GM Easy Steer, and it was, very, it was variable hydraulic steering. So, and travel your wheel, this is even before wheel angle sensors were, you know, huge in these electric power steering vehicles. You turn it so far in the vehicle, and the orbital was variable. So the more pressure and, you know, more hard, the harder you turned it or the more you saw it on the wheel, the more power steering pressure you, you got to it. So backing up a trailer, it was so nice when you're, you know, you're back and <laughs> forth trying to weave it in somewhere, and it's just one finger. And that's, and that's ideal. That's kind of what you want. But definitely not at high speeds. Yeah, no, not at high speed. You know, at, uh, you know when you're cruising 80 miles an hour down the highway, uh, a little steering input goes a long way, guys. So let's talk about the hydraulic part of it the pump and uh, the rack itself, what sort of consideration should a technician be taking if they're replacing, let's say, just a power steering pump or they replace the rack and uh, they're trying to make sure that that power steering pump is okay? So the two biggest killers of hydraulic systems are cavitation, so mixing air with oil, and you know, you kind of get this foamy, frothy deal kind of going, and then contamination. So hydraulic systems are required to be extremely, extremely clean. So dirt, debris, all that stuff will wreak havoc on your pump and your power steering components. So a lot of times, you know, I, if I'm doing, if I have someone that, that kills a pump or kills a rack, it's usually the conversation that you have to have is that this is a, it's kind of a total system replacement. So we need to put two lines on this. We need to put a pump on it as well because a, if a bushing or a bearing fails in your steering box or in your pump, those metal shavings and contaminations are now through the entire system. And the time it takes to clean that stuff out is, A, it takes a long time, but you can never really guarantee that all the metal and contamination is going to be out of the system. So replacing, you know, everything kind of might be your best option there. Yeah, I used a couple of those inline filters on the return line to capture some of those metal particles before it goes back into the pump. Those seem to work to help preserve the pump. Um, I had one uh, power steering pump manufacturer who came to us and he says, the best way to uh, bleed these systems is to um, don't start the engine, <coughs> don't let the engine idle. Uh, just crank the engine over until you start to see enough stuff coming through the return line um, to make sure everything's flush because if you're running the engine at you know, 1100 RPMs and it's a dry pump, there could be damage caused to it. Yeah, that's what, you know, in a hydraulic system, lubrication is key. If there's, if there's not oil where it's not going to, not, it doesn't need to be, or vice versa, it's, um, you know, you don't have oil in the system, you're going to burn the thing up really, really fast. So, and hydraulic parts are, you know, hydraulic steering components or hydraulic parts in any circumstance are not cheap. So, you're really going to rack up some money if, you, uh, if you're kind of careless with your installations. I saw one of a, a good uh, answer to our uh, question about the electric power steering here. I'm trying to find his name again, but he said it was the 1951 Chrysler Imperial. I'll have to check that. Wow, that's, you learn something new every day. I, you have to think how cool those cars were and how far they were ahead of their time, you know, with the power tops and all that. That's, um, that, is, that is pure American innovation. And, uh, you know, I have a soft spot for those cars. I'd like <laughs> to own one of those one day. And, you know, they're getting to be hen's teeth to find. Because not only, A, do the Derby guys love them, but it's a, you know, it's a classic car that's absolutely gorgeous. Um, so that was a good question. It, it, and, you know, you think about those Imperials, they were the first ones to have uh, disc brakes. The more you know. I did not know that. Um, I think that was 48, but don't quote me on that. Um, so let's kind of move on to this first question we have here from uh, Jack's class. Um, the first question here, let's, let's play that video. 
My name is Ram, and my question to you is, what are your thoughts on the next step in electronic steering and suspension? That's a really great question. So in my mind, I, I eventually think electronic power steering is going to replace all our hydraulic steering. It's, um, you know, with the way electronic technology is developing between brushless motors and kind of in that deal, you know, how we're going with electric automobiles, it's, um, I think eventually hydraulic steering will go away in the OE manufacturer wayside and it's either going to, it's going to be all electronic. Now, same with suspension. I think suspension is going to get even crazier with MagRide becoming a more viable option. You know, some of the, the new C8s have it. It was uh, on some GM, other GM vehicles through the, uh, the late, I would say, into the you know, late 2010s into, into modern stuff. And I can't wait to see that stuff hit the aftermarket. I think eventually MagRide suspension will be something that, that we're retrofitting onto vehicles. Like, you know, if I'm building a, a Camaro or a Chevelle or some, something late model, Instead of, besides coilovers, I think MagRide is going to be a, you know, a viable option. Also along the lines of like electronic variable suspension valving, I think will become more and more available, not only in OE applications, but in the aftermarket as well. And I think we'll be able to put it on a lot of cool stuff. So I'm excited for that technology to, you know, come to kind of fruition. It, it, it's endless right now. We're starting to see ADOS. So lane keeping, lane departure, um, collision avoidance. It's all dependent on these, being able to steer the vehicle out of the way of trouble. Um, you know, we've recently seen those with some of the Ford trucks that have the, uh, the ability to back up and park and pick up a trailer. That's electric power steering. That's, the, that's definitely the future, and it adds a whole nother, um, you know, life to this. And then on top of it, these can work in electric vehicles, too. So, but to your point, I think, yeah, you're right about the suspension. The next thing I think that's going to come up is variable ratio power steering. And um, I think that we're starting to see those on, I think Mercedes has a system. Ford started to have a system. I haven't heard too much about this, but we've got a picture of it here. Um, I think that's the first picture in uh, Ashley that I send the, the uh, Ford power steering. Bingo. Variable ratio. So you could be in a parking lot, have really direct steering, have the level of assist there that you need still have the feel on the freeway. Um, so it's definitely a, a game changer, but yeah, I don't think electric power steering, you're right, it's not gonna go away. Yeah, and steering, like you said, kind of the variable steering ratio is super cool because that's something, you know, when you build a race car and you kind of change is your steering ratio. We either use a quick, a, you know, a steering quickener or a steering, you know, something to slow it down. But to be able to have a, you know, a one to one ratio or a one to three ratio and that change on the fly, it is really cool. And this kind of goes back to a question we just got from uh, DatRed86. Uh, do you think uh, more electronics in a car is a good thing, including power steering, or should things stay mechanical? So we like mechanical simplicity. That is a nice factor. But automotive technology is, you know, it's driven. And we're obviously heading towards EVs. And so I always like to make the argument, you know, the first vehicle was invented in 1903, or I shouldn't say invented, but the first cars were readily available from Henry Ford, you know, in 1903. And that was a base model, you know, look at where we were then and look at where we are now. There's nothing, you used to be able to drive down the road and adjust the, the timing on your car. Yep. And um, now we can, we have dual climate control. That's, that's where the world's went. So I think with technology and the diagnostic purposes of it is that technology is good. I am. Um, I like the complications of the electronic systems because the thing that comes with that is the diagnosis. So the more stuff that is electronically supported, the easier it is for me to plug my scan tool into it and get, you know, I can get live data. I can, it's, you know, old cars didn't have steering, you know, you didn't have steering angle sensors and all this stuff. Now I can see, you know, oh, I can look at steering angle sensors and see if your tie rod, you know, you can, you can use that as something to see if your tie rods are out of adjustment. Like there's, there's more and more and the more hands you put in that cookie jar, the more that the diagnostic becomes easier. Definitely. And, you know, this goes back to a point with Tesla even. If you, uh, a steering angle sensor reset, um, if you start to go in through, if your school has a Tesla there to play with or if even you have friends, go through that service menu and start going through the different features and options, and you'll notice something in there, I think it's on the Y and also the X, 
It's called a steering angle offset. So if it detects over a certain amount of time, it's sort of like pull compensation on General Motors vehicles, um, that it's developed like a three degree thing, it will automatically adjust the electric power steering so it doesn't feel like the owner's fighting against the steering. Like you probably had before with like a, just a conventional hydraulic system. I mean, we've always dealt with those vehicles that had a pole and you're fighting against it. Electric power steering can take care of that. Yeah, and that's, I think, the people, like I said, technology, when people aren't familiar with it, always kind of pushes people away and they get a lot, they're not, they're used to what they had before and I think they're a little apprehensive about it. But once you put, like I say, you know, everybody I've seen drive a Tesla or it's been their first time in the car and then they drive it and they respect the technology, like, oh, this is cool. It's, um, you know, you have to experience it to uh, fully appreciate it. And I think it's going to be the same way with working on some of these electronic systems on these newer cars, is that the older techs are just going to have to see how great the technology is, and then I think that's going to, it's going to be way more welcomed. Okay, this is prompted by Robert Ballard here at, at Chapel Hill High School. Um, he's wondering, can a bad chassis ground cause the electronic stability control to stop working? Undoubtedly. So with modern electronic systems on vehicles, grounds are one of the most important things on the vehicle. So uh, me being, you know, we'd all had drove older vehicles. Do you remember putting static straps on your bumper to oh, make, yeah. your, make your radio work better? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, the same, it's, uh, it's the same concept. So the more grounds you have or the more, you know, two ground you are, the, the better electro electricity is going to work and, you know, flow through systems and that kind of deal. So if you have a broken ground or you have some crusty grounds or a bunch of questionable ones, it's going to give you fits because it's got a lot of resistance in the system. It's going to be hard on electronic components. And um, I think a bad ground can cause you a lot of simple issues. Definitely. And, you know, you think about electric power steering, the ABS system, and the ECM for the engine, they're typically connected to a high-speed CAN bus. And if the high-speed CAN bus is not working properly and that CAN bus goes down, you're basically asking all three of those critical components to operate on their own, and they're not designed to. Nope, and that's what you need good, clean electrical, system, or electrical signals for CAN bus systems. And that's, you're right, especially, you know, some of the alternators, if the, you have ripple voltage, I mean, if you look at a CAN bus signal um, in one of your electronics courses, you'll see this up, down, up, down, and you'll see a high-low signal. And it's usually a square wave, depending on the length of the wave and everything else, what it's communicating. But if you have a alternator that has ripple voltage or AC voltage coming out of it, it's totally going to throw that whole thing off because if you look at an AC sine wave go like this and then you throw the CAN bus on top of it, it's basically mimicking it and giving it false signals. Yeah, and that's the crazy part about CAN, bu CAN bus systems now. I, um, I had a, a friend with a, uh, you know, a Pontiac G8 that had a, one of the O2 sensor wires had uh, been grounded out and was doing some weird stuff and was throwing off how the transmission shifted. And it took good old, you know, Lots of hours of diagnosis, not, nothing I can learn, you know, going through and checking, you know, looking at stuff on a scope and seeing these, you know, electrical signals to figure out what's exactly wrong. And it's just one simple rub through bare wire touching the chassis and, you know, throwing the whole thing off. So that is um, good clean grounds and good clean electrical signals are very important in these modern systems. And uh, we were talking before we walked in here about what happens with electric power steering when um, there's issues with the system either overheating or having to work too hard. What is the failure mode or the limp mode for a lot of electric power steering? So there is, there is failure mode. You do will get a steer light if you uh, have some problems. So either like a bad steering angle sensor, bad ground, the motor can die out on some of these units, just like anything, you know, things wear and these parts do need replaced on these cars. So I know in the Toyota systems that I'm pretty familiar, familiar with, when they go into failure mode, they still work and they operate, you know, correctly. I'm not sure about these, like a GM unit like we have here, like here, but if it does fail out, you're still able to drive it and move the thing around, but it's going to be like driving with, you know, on your conventional older vehicle with hydraulic power steering, it's going to be like taking the belt off your hydraulic pump and then it's just not going to work. You're probably <laughs> going to have to fight the motor a little bit because you are turning that back and forth, but... 
if the in the event that the thing does die, it um you know you still have the ability to either get the vehicle to the side of the road safely or move the thing around a parking lot need be till you can get it repaired. I think the great thing about these two is you've got codes, and the codes typically will have stuff for um, when it happened, why it happened, why it overheated, and this is typically the freeze frame information um, on a lot more sophisticated systems to where, I mean, the earliest cobalt, I mean, it just went into a lint mode and then set like the dash off, a light on the dash, but with a lot more of these systems, they're a lot more sophisticated. You can kind of know, is it a CAN bus issue? Did the motor overheat? Um, was there an issue with other things with the system being able to work properly? Was a sensor input missing from the steering angle sensor? So it's gotten a lot better with the diagnostics. Yeah, and the diagnostics part of it, especially as a technician, is key. So, because a lot of us are going to work either hourly or flat rate, and you know, being able to have good, healthy diagnosis to keep yourself on track, and um, you know, to where you're staying under your book times and everything is important. So, being able to plug your <coughs> scanner in and see, you know, get all this information and collect this information to make a healthy diagnosis is important. Versus with your regular hydraulic steering, you know, you're crawling, oh, the thing's got a power steering line and the power steering stopped working. So, you know, we're going to check to see if there's fluid in it and if the belt, you know, if the belt's too loose. And there's the, um, you know, with old hydraulic systems, you know, on, in your hands, looking with your eye, diagnostic is the only way to do it. You know, you're looking for leaks, bad belts, bad pumps. That, and the only way you're going to be able to tell that is putting your hands physically on it versus a elect new electronic system like this where I can plug my scanner in and start with a little bit more information than just a visual inspection. And this goes back to L. Johnson from Clover Park Technical College. Thank you for submitting the question here. He, he says he understands the more electronic communication within a vehicle allows for more transparency for the finding of faults and causes. However, what are the cons to this? Um, if you want me to take this one. Yeah, I, um, <laughs> I'm really not sure how to answer that one. Um, I think what it is with the cons could be just the interdependence of certain things of a, a wheel speed sensor um, input into the electronic power steering system that could make it more um, issues with uh, you know the system functioning properly. Um, Diagnostics, if you rely too much on just a, a, a code to indicate to replace a part, that's typically not going to work out too great for you. Um, and uh, uh, that, that's basically it. I, I can't really see too many cons with it, not unless you have it. Yes, it's going to be more expensive for the tooling to do it, um, but we'll have to... Uh, see from there. I mean that's it all comes with time and with technology and how it's developing you know its steering systems are going to keep going farther and farther so as Andrew said I don't think there's really any cons to this system it's just learning how these new systems are going to function and us being able to work on them efficiently. Ooh, Tom Welk from Auburn uh, Career Center uh, electric power steering is great but when they fail they tr uh, they are turning the wheels uh, is there any way to make it any easier? Um, you got to fix the system because the, yeah, the lint mode is kind of sensitive. Yeah, you know, fixing after a electronic power steering um, failure, the the correct thing to do is is fix it. You know, driving it with a hurt system, it's just like kind of driving a you know a car where a power steering pump died on it. And you're like, I need to lift the thing home, so you pop the belt off it. Uh, driving it home with it, you know a a power steering box manual style is uh, is really not great for it, and the the forearms will uh, will thank you later when you <laughs> fix it. Like I said, if anybody's drove something that has you know an old car with where manual steering was still an option, you know I have a, my Honda Civic has a, has manual steering on it, and uh, or you know some older GM stuff or even your classic cars that um said you drove that thing uh you know one, two, three miles an hour through a parking lot and you're sitting there uh, sawing away at the wheel. My Suzuki Samurai, it was it was manual steering too. And uh, so that was, you'd go off road and you'd be wheeling through rocks and uh, your four, like I said, your forearms would be pounding by the end of it because you were just sawing at the wheel. You know, it's funny, I had my 1967 Rambler American and it had, I think it was an F7014, really narrow tire, and I couldn't find anything like that, so I went with a 205, 75, 14 on, on the vehicle. 
man, does that make steering tough. Yeah, no, like I said, once you get into a tire that has a larger contact pattern to the road in a manual steering vehicle, that's, um, said it's your forearms are what feel it. Like, uh, you know, and you can add, like, a lot of guys used to add those steering wheel knob, the, the steering knob. The necker knob. Yep, on one of those so you could drive something with a giant wheel in it and, you know. There was, there was the, uh, that was really popular back in the day. You know, you could order one of those out of a catalog or go down to your local hardware store and buy one for your truck or tractor or whatever you fancy putting it on. But um, that is the cool part about, you know, even in uh, the aftermarket applications with steering boxes and stuff like that and uh, what's available. So, you know, you have, you get boxes like some of them Borgs in or P, um, PSCs, a really great steering company. And, um, you know, you can, with, if you're restoring a Camaro and, or, you know, any kind of late model car, even late model cars, but, uh, you know, your Camaro, Mustang, that kind of deal, your, your core automotive stuff, they sell different ratio boxes, restored stuff, you know, so you can go mild to wild, or you can get real crazy and do steering rack conversions on these if you're getting after it, doing some racing. Aaron Hicks brings up a good point. GM failure mode will often still work, however, it will say reduce uh, assist Power steering reduce, uh, assist reduced. Yes, that typically comes up, and it'll, it'll give you stuff at certain speeds, but it's not fully active. Yeah, it'll. Uh, yeah, it kind of gives you a little bit of input, but that's the other thing is when these systems, you know, if you have a steering angle sensor, you know, kind of get a little wonky, or even like uh, your wheel speed sensors, you get weird with the sensors. You know, having issues, you'll get weird feedback from the steering wheel sometimes because it doesn't know it's confused by the signal you're <laughs> sending to it, and then that's what kicks it into that failure mode. So it is very important that if you're starting to have steering issues and you're getting these lights, that you do check it and figure it out because you don't want to drive it like that and potentially cost yourself more money by wearing out other parts. And with the cowl mounted stuff and also the uh, stuff mounted on the rack. There is typically, either on the side of the, I'm going to point this out right here, this is the power input into it. But sometimes on other parts of the wiring harness, there's also a thermocouple that is, oh, actually, that's the connection for the steering angle sensor. But it's measuring the temperature inside the motor itself. So it's calculating, it's measuring it or it's calculating by the amount of load that's being put on the, uh, the steering gear to kind of cut it back a little bit so it doesn't, damage it thermally. Yeah, you don't want to overheat one of the, uh, the, one of the biggest enemies of electronics is, is heat and moisture. So, A, you don't want this thing to get wet or that kind of deal, but you don't want it to overheat because overheat, it, overheating is bad for parts, especially conventional brushed motors. You get something too hot, you'll either weld the brushes to the, the deal or the brushes start to break down, then the motor fails, and then you're replacing the whole unit and you're gonna have a, you're gonna have a bad time. Here's a second question from uh, Jack's students. Um, and let's play that second question. Hi, I'm Ethan, and I'm replacing the control arm on this HHR. We just had to push out the old bushing and put in a new one. Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts are about replacing the whole set or just the bushing, or if you had any tips or tricks. Now that is a fantastic question. So a big thing about being a tech nowadays is being efficient and being efficient with your time, whether you're working flat rate or you're hourly. So you can replace, in, in my personal experience, I like to do whole control arms at this point because for the simple fact, if the bushing itself is wore out, probably the lower ball joint and another bushing in the arm is gonna be wore out as well. And with the cost of some of these replacement arms from great companies like Moog or Mevotech, you know, it's, you, you can't beat it the time you save installing a whole control arm versus taking the thing over to the press, pushing a bushing out, or trying to do a ball joint. And then it's the tool investment on top of that that you have to think about. So if I'm just doing the control arm, I don't need a ball. If I'm going to do a complete control arm, I don't need a, a ball joint press to push bushings out, or I don't need a big press or torches for say, but I can take a whole control arm, bust some bolts out, you know, pop a ball, ball joint out and replace this whole control arm and I know everything's new and good, get, the, get an alignment and get the thing back on the road. So in my personal experience, I like to replace the whole control arm just for saving time and peace of mind. I couldn't agree more. I mean, especially with electric power steering, you're dealing with uh, something if you pull out a scan tool and you look at the test and reset section of there. Um, I don't know where it is on the GM uh, scan tool, but I know on like Autel and Launch, 
you can reset the pull compensation. And what that does is it kind of resets the angle of the steering to help compensate for certain pulls and things to, that could be an issue with the suspension or even the alignment. If you're replacing the complete component, you know that the alignment angles are going to be pro uh, properly done. You're going to know that it's, you, know, you don't have a stiff ball joint. You don't all of a sudden have a weird caster issue. And uh, I really do like those complete control arms. Um, they can make a big difference in the yep. total repair. And a lot of times they come with a great warranty too. So, like I know like Moog does different series of, of their arms. So they do kind of more in an economy deal than a, you know, a, a premium brand. And I know some of it like, I, I, don't quote me on it, but I know they're, um, I believe they're like R series, which is like their more economy. I think it carries like a three year warranty, which that's is good. That's, that's excellent. And I think the other one might carry a lifetime or a five year. Again, I'm, I'm not, I've replaced a lot of the stuff, but uh, I haven't read the outside of the box that much to be able to tell you guys. <laughs> you know, speaking of reading boxes, I recently saw something from ZF. They're recommending they're replacing both control arms at the same time. I kind of agree with that, especially in the case of the bushings. Yeah, so I, I do like to bite the bullet when it comes to front-end replacements and do it all. So, you know, upper, lower control arms, inner, outer tie rods. Um, you know, if you're working on some older GM stuff, uh, maybe even doing your one your unit bearings while you're there. If you have a four wheel drive unit, think about doing the axles, because you know biting the bullet once and doing everything at once might be a, a healthy cost up front, but it saves you from going back and have to say you know oh I did my lower control arms, so well, I got to do my uppers next month. Well, I got to tear all the same stuff back apart to replace you know, a, a component in a similar area. So A, to save yourself time, money, and a headache, you know, do it all at once and just, just get it done. And then you get a, you know, a nice fresh alignment. And you know, that's the other thing is doing, you know, this stuff one at a time. Well, if I just did my lowers and now I did my uppers, well, I need to get an alignment again because everything's going to be out and different. And, you know, alignments aren't cheap. You can spend anywhere from 80 bucks on a budget alignment all the way up to, you know, if you're getting a race car style alignment, a couple hundred dollars. So um, to save yourself time and money, and, the, and plus you got to take it down there, sit around for a little bit or drop it off. And uh, so I think just to save yourself time, money, hassle, headache, doing all the st steering components at once is an even better idea. Ghost Cat Entertainment from NKC Schools Auto Tech. Um, so they say here, we have a MKZ that we replaced the electric rack. Uh, we had to program the rack on the car. Will you have to program the aftermarket rack if you put it into a hot rod? I, that's a tough one. So I know in the applications I've done for retrofits with the GM units and even the Toyota, the Toyota units, that it was, there was no calibration required with those ones at least. So it, uh, it kind of learns, it doesn't, it's not like you have an actual steering, uh, angle sensor on the steering wheel itself in your application. So I know with the with the Toyota ones that I've retrofitted into off-road applications, it's literally install it in line, put power to it. It's in its fail-safe mode, which it stays powered up if everything's good. And um, it's set it and forget it. You know, you put your, it measures how much input you have through the steering wheel. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a smart self-contained unit. So. I can't quote you on the E-Pass units or the Flaming River stuff, but I assume it is extremely similar and there's really no <clears throat> headache to it. It's kind of a, you know, install, power, and play deal. I think on some of the E-Pass stuff, you do have to pull in a, um, a vehicle speed from the transmission sometimes. But those ones are neat because actually underneath the dash, you've got a potentiometer where you can turn it off if you're going down the drag strip or turn it up if you're parking it in a garage or something. Yeah, I do, and you are incorrect in that aspect. I know with some of the guys doing GM conversions as well is to use the this style unit here out of a Saturn view. Is I know that's a really common one is they come out of views. Um, is that the potentiometer is is a great upgrade, and it's I think it's crucial to the system because that's that's a big thing is you don't want full potatoes power steering when you're doing 85 miles an hour down the highway or you're making a pass <laughs> down the drag strip. Um, you know you need variable steering input. Um, which brings up, you know, a, a great point about electric power steering. What's the advantage for fuel economy? 
Oh, I mean, so you have to think, like, in a lot of race car applications, we ditch the power steering pump and go to manual rack. So if you're building a drag car or that kind of deal, simply for the horse, like, a power steering pump is like an AC compressor. And when that thing's on, it eats up a ton of horsepower. So it could be anywhere from, you know, 20, I, I'd like to say above 20% in, uh, you know, in accessories. So say I have an 100 horsepower engine and it's say it's eating 10, 12% off the front of the drive. That's a, that's 10 horsepower, 12 horsepower. You, uh, you have to think about it. So, and it could even go up with more, depending on how your, what kind of power steering setup you have, it could go up more from there. So if, you know, if you have a, you're building a crazy rock crawler and it's got a big giant aftermarket, you know, power steering pump on it and a giant steering box or a, you know, a, a power assist ram for, you know, some crazy front steering, that, uh, that hydraulic pump can take a lot of demand. And um, so I think that's the cool part about the electronic power steering aspect is that there is no parasitic loss on the front of the motor. This is your alternators controlling it all. So you have one, your condensing units that you have to hang off the front of this thing and run a crazy serpentine belt system and, and you know, make it a little more complicated. You can think about it. If you're going down the freeway, that power steering pump is running the same as the engine, and that's when you need the least amount of assist is when you're going down the freeway. It's not until you go low speeds when the pump's turning you know, idle backing out of the stop that needs the most assist. So it's definitely for fuel economy and also power too. Yeah, it uh, like I said, it eats, it eats up a lot of, uh, you know, essentially the less, the less parasitic drag you have on the motor and the more efficiently it can run and, you know, pushing it down the highway, the more stuff you can get rid of off the front, the better things going to run. And sort of a thing, if, if you're a student out there and you've got access to a scan tool, also instructors, this is a pretty neat thing to see. If you have a vehicle with electric power steering in your shop and you're able to pull up the two data PIDs, the one for throttle angle and then also for uh, the electric power steering, the, the angle of uh, movement, look at how much it changes and how much throttle angle it increases when it is changing the steering. And that kind of gives you an idea that these things could probably take up 30, 40 amps of power. Um, so. And it's all tied together also with the ECM to make sure that the customer doesn't notice, like, you know, the engine falling flat on its face when someone does a sudden correction um, with electric power steering. Yeah, that is the cool part about all these, having all these complicated electric systems is that they all talk, they all talk together and um, they all feed off each other. And it's, uh, it's cool how it, you know, the vehicle is smart enough to delegate power and that kind of stuff to what needs it most at the current time. So, but I agree with what you said is, you know, probably running one of these in a low, you know, in a, driving it around a parking lot, moving it around between spaces is one of the things going to have the most load on it. Is that low one, two mile an hour trying to turn the wheels lock to lock is what's going to eat up the most. Yep. And just that basic principle of understanding how the steering linkage works, how the assist is given, that will get you through the A4. Um, but the other thing that's going to get you through the A4 is just basic geometry. Um, you know, we've got a, a question coming here from uh, Jack. Uh, let's run that question number uh, three here. Hey guys, I just picked up this old YJ and it's got a little bit of tire rub when I'm turning, tire touching the leaf spring. I see on the Summit Racing site that you've got some wheel spacers, but I'm wondering which one should I choose? That's a really great question. Now, wheel spacers is a that's that there's a lot of that's a compound question because it, it depends on a lot on your application. So I always like to tell people personally to shy away from wheel spacers and that a properly offsetted wheel is the answer to all your problems because. It's, it, it, they just work better. You have less stuff you're trying to bolt on and, uh, you know, it takes a little, it makes it a little bit safer. Now, I can see on your YJ there that you have a set of aluminum wheels on it. So, with an aluminum wheel, the boss is naturally, you know, where you're bolting the wheel, the face is going to be thicker. So, I think by the time you put a wheel spacer behind there, whether it be like, it be like a, just a slip-on spacer, that you're not going to have enough lug nut, nut engagement. And there's a, there's a certain math ratio to how many threads per size of the bolt and um, you know you sit there and figure that out and see how many threads you exactly need I but um as I you know what I was getting at was with that you might not have a thread engagement and then the wheel you know it's not safe to drive on the road 
Then you get into an actual bolt-on spacer where you'd slip those over your lug nuts, put your lug nuts on, torque it, and then it has another set of five lug nuts that you're bolting your wheel onto. Those are great, but the issue is, is A, you've added a second set of lug nuts to the set, so you're going to get a little, you're going to get a little more, um, not, I don't want to say mechanical advantage, but leverage over your, your ball joint and all that kind of stuff, and now you've added a second set of wheel studs, so there's just another point to stress and break something off at that point. So, in my, like I said, in my professional opinion, I think a set of properly offsetted wheels, whether those be a set of steel replacements or uh, another set of aluminums, but yeah, the um, wheel spacers are great in some applications, but it's not something I personally like to use. My question is, is if you put spacers on that Jeep and you change the track, does that make it a little bit more susceptible to the death wobble? Yes, yeah, so especially with, you know, your, your, the Mopar stuff, so, you know, YJs, TJs, JKs, and I haven't been in a JL that death wobbled out or yet, but, hmm. you know, um, they're, they're new, they're brand new, so I don't think, and they've done a ton of steering, you know, upgrades and changes on the JLs. Now, had what Andrew said, when you take that and you put that wheel out there, and like I said, you have, you're now putting, you know, instead of having a wheel right up against the bearing, you've now added two inches or three inches to between that bearing and the wheel itself. So driving the Jeep, you know, you have some loose steering components, that kind of deal. Well, now you have these wheels that are, you know, it's, it's way more out there and it's going to have more advantage over some of the steering components. So it could make the thing more susceptible to a death wobble or, uh, you know, some crazy steering issues. Would that be the scrub radius? Robert wrote in, yeah, the scrub radius because you're moving the wheels out even yep. more. Um, yeah, that's a, a good point. You know, just those little things and the, you know, let's talk inspection on some of these steering systems, um, especially with power steering and just the steering components. What type of inspection would you usually perform on a vehicle that came into your shop with the driver complaining that, you know, the steering feels loose? So with that, if I have somebody that brings a car in, you know, first thing it to do is put the thing on the rack and start to, and start to check it out. Are you going to go for the test drive first? Uh, you know, there's sometimes I, uh, I've had somebody pull something in the shop and I was very thankful I, uh, I didn't test drive it. <laughs> you know, the guys that come in were, oh, I just need my tires rotated or I just need a tire and then the wheel bearing is ready to fall out of the thing. But uh, I do like to throw them on the rack first, just get a general, you know, see if there's anything that just like jumps out at me and smacks me in the face that that's, that's going to be wrong. So where they're using kind of like a, I have a set of those, um, uh, they're made by race ramp, but they're these foam, they're, they're foam blocks. And what I like to do is if I put the thing on the four post lift, I slide one of those blocks underneath there and I put, I'll either put my camber like a piece of steel plate or one of my um, camber plates on top. And I sit there and I grab my pry bar and, you know, you're just checking, you know, seeing what's loose, whether it be upper or lower ball joints, uh, bushings, you know, you take the wheel and you have someone turn the wheel for you and you kind of see how much plays in the steering linkage before the actual wheel physically turns. And then if you can't identify anything there, then it's, um, you know, it's dump jumping into it a little deeper. So, you know, pop the wheels off the thing and start to look for other, you know, dry, but, you know, dry steering joints or, you know, play in the inner and outer socket on a steering rack. And the thing with steering components is everything wears, um, everything wears. Yeah. So you might be just, oh, this thing needs a lower ball joint right now. And I put a lower ball joint in it and my issue improves a little bit, but it doesn't totally fix it. A lot of times what you have to do is replace all this stuff at once or multiple things at once to get a true improvement because if everything's a little bit loose, the thing's going to drive, like for lack of a better ter term, everything's a lot of loose. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pull up that picture I have of the Jeep front suspension. Um, it's the rusty one. Bingo. I mean, this is a great example of what could wear out. I'm looking at tie rod ends. Um, the steering stabilizer, um, you name it on there, that can eventually wear out and cause issues. Yeah, I mean, especially in a, like a, in a drag link setup like this, a lot of things can get loose. And Mo, Mopars are, you know, I don't, I don't mean to hate on those guys, but, you know, in those early Dodge, you know, your mid-90s through up through 04, like Dodge trucks, or especially their one-tons and that kind of units, 
they uh, they had some steering issues, and those trucks <clears> would wear out and do they would what we like to refer to as a death wobble, and that's where you're driving the thing down the road 60 miles an hour, you smack a pothole or something like that, and the whole truck shakes and uh it wakes you up and especially if you have a five or a six speed truck and you know you got a trailer behind the thing or you're heading to work and you got a whole bed a bed of stuff, there's a lot going on in the office at that point, you know. The whole thing's shaking, you're trying to get it slowed down in traffic, not smack the car next to you, like, it, uh, it can be a little scary at times. So, having good tight steering components and staying on top of that and making sure, you know, your stuff's in great health to drive down the road every day is very important because nobody wants to deal with that every morning. And you don't especially want that to cause you an accident, you know, not only hurt yourself, but potentially hurt somebody else. That's... It's just amazing to see what can go wrong on a test drive, especially with those death wobbles and making sure that everything is working properly. Yeah, it's a scary part is when you have somebody bring a car, truck, or you know, a Jeep into the you know into your shop, and you go and drive that thing, and they're like, "Oh yeah, it's not that bad," and you're sitting, you know, your hair's all spiked up, and you're all white <laughs> knuckle, but like, I don't get how you drive that every day. Like, um, I'm scared. I can't believe it. I can't believe it made it here under its own power. Got a question that just came in from the YouTube audience, and they were wondering how do you isolate an electric power steering problem from an issue that is mechanical in nature, like a tie rod end? If there's an issue with the rack, I guess you're talking about versus something on the, you know, like an outer or inner tie rod. I mean, it must be confusing. I mean, it could be. Yeah, I could see if how trying to diagnose a loose or a tight tie rod end could be affected by, you know, your steering unit or having a you know a dead spot in the steering unit if you had a sensor wear out to where the thing gets a weird input spot um, and just trying but uh, again that's going to be like um, a di like um, I'm, I'm lost for the word here kind of diagnose in diagnosing you know you're building a sandwich so essentially you're taking apart a sandwich yeah. is, the, is the best <laughs> so you need to go through your order operations and checking components so undoing your tie rod ends physically putting your hand on these and checking them for in and out play, inspecting the boot and the, the ball to make sure that in the tie rod end that the ball has a full range of motion and is tight or is it, you know doesn't have any play in it. And then it's going to be disconnecting that stuff and seeing how the steering unit functions without any outside input on it. So actually trying to turn your wheels or any of that, you know, making sure your rack, you know, something in the rack assembly isn't messed up or broken. So it's, um, it's going to be, you know, order of operations and figuring out what's worn to figure out, to differentiate, sorry I messed that word up, um, to figure out what's bad, whether it be your power steering unit or a mechanical piece like an inner and outer tie rod. Okay, great question here, kind of moving on to the, uh, the service and replacement part here. This is another one of Jack's students asking about a seized bolt. My name is Bryn Borden. Last week we had to do some front end work on this Dakota. We had to replace the lower control arms and we ended up having to cut out the lower uh, bolts because they were so seized inside the bushings. We were wondering if you've ever encountered that problem and how you found the easiest way to uh, fix it was. Such a great question. <laughs> so me and Andrew, you know, as you guys know, we're up here in the Akron, Ohio area. So we're right in, in the Rust Belt. So we see this stuff all the time. Everything here gets, you know, seized and broken or rusted off. So I personally love, you know, things can't stay tight if they're liquid. I'm a big torch advocate. So, but there's other, you know, there's other great tools where you have to get your sawzall or cutoff wheel out and, you know, cut the ends of the bolt out so you can drop the control arm. They have really cool tools now like, um, the induction, I don't know if you use an induction yep. bolt heater yet, yep. but that is a crazy, you know, I was a, um, I was very skeptical about it until I put one in my hands and was able, you're able to heat bolts in quite a different way than uh, your conventional torch does. But there's also another fan, like a big part in that is, is vibration. So your air hammer can be a key tool to get some of those bolts out. And you know, a little bit of lube like some PB Blaster or WD-40 can also, or aero coil, can go a long way as well. I have to agree, you know, Croil or some of the other penetrants to get in there and to help break it up make a big difference. And yeah, yeah, the vibration, definitely. Yeah, so in, in my order operations, you know, I try to spin it out with the impact. If that doesn't work, then I hit it with the air hammer. If that doesn't work, 
depending on the location, it's either I'm getting the torches out and I'm making that bolt liquid and it's going to come out, or I'm cutting it with a cutoff wheel or sawzall blade. So those are kind of the uh, go-to necessary, you know, tools for that. Um, okay, here, just another question coming in here. Um, in regards to the ASC A4, let's go to um, question number five from uh, his students here. I, th I thought that was a really great question that they uh, got for us in regards to how what you need to study for this exam. Hello, my name is Wyatt, and we are in the middle of taking our student ASC tests. I was wondering, what sources do you use when you are studying for your steering and suspension ASC test? Man, you guys showed up with some really great questions today. <laughs> So one of the things, there's a lot of practice tests and that kind of stuff you can take on the internet. And um, I think there's even like apps and different stuff you can get on your phone. So that is um, kind of one of the go-to necessities to sit there and kind of get you, you know, gets rid of your pre-test jitters and kind of gives you an idea of what kind of questions you can see on the test. Because the test is very important and it is dominated by steering component questions. Definitely. I mean, the... A4, it goes everything from steering, I'm looking at the TASIS right now, <clears throat> all the way through front suspension, rear suspension, uh, ride control. I think there's even a little bit on even air ride in this uh, uh, section. But yeah, the ones I like are just keep on being curious. Hands-on is probably some of the best information. Uh, listening to your instructor, using your lab time properly. Um, outside of that, Look for a ASC study guide that has practice tests, but the practice test should also have an explanation on why you know, a certain question was right or a certain answer was wrong. Um, so look for those. Uh, Tomorrow's Technician, our website, um, we have a lot of great articles on there for uh, a lot of modern technologies that are coming your way and also studying too. I think we have a whole section on the ASC G1. Um, we also have a LMS sponsored by Summit Racing for uh, instructors and students to use to where they can watch a video, uh, get a certificate of completion, and instructors, you can track your um, students through this, and that's at the Tomorrow's Technician website, um, and you can also link to that on there. It says uh, enroll now, or I'm trying to remember what it says exactly on the website, but look for T2U, and it's going to help you out big time. Yeah, I, I appreciate there, Andrew, that you mentioned listening to your instructor and kind of, you know, taking some, uh, you know, listening to the old techs in the shop is a, uh, as a, when I was 18 years old and I worked into a, a shop for the first time, I kind of wish I would have kept my mouth shut a little more and uh, and listened a little more. So uh, those, uh, some of those old, I, um, I learned some of my greatest lessons and tips and tricks as a tech from some of them older guys in the shop that, you know, they were, you know, they were 18 starting in a shop one day too, and uh, those guys, if they're willing to share the information, it's very important that you guys listen to that because those guys have a lot of good things to say. So being a sponge and listening a lot is is a really, you know, your ears are one of the greatest tools you've uh, you've been given. It, it makes sense if you lose, use them. Yeah, two ears and one mouth. Yep. Um, kind of puts the importance on the ears. So, Justin, we're at the end here, the last minute and a half of this. Any advice you'd like to give students when they're solving a, a power steering or problem or going after a noise issue? So, a big uh, one of my greatest pieces of advice is going to be, you know, use use your use your eyes. So, physically putting your hands on it and checking, you know, for leaks under the hood and that kind of deal is going to be one of your greatest tools. So. And then the other aspect of it is you have to be willing to, you know, remove components and kind of get a little deeper into it to figure out exactly what your issue is going to be. So physically putting your hands on it, checking the stuff in there, getting dirty, is um, that's going to be really important in figuring out what steering components are, are going to be loose. And I'd like to add to that, and this goes to um, Sean's question, uh, Reese Dorfer from North Farmington High School, um, about chassis ears. Um, I like the wireless versions. They're nice uh, to be able to track down those uh, issues um, with uh, certain areas and components on the vehicle um, to know where the problem is and get something isolated. 
just don't leave them on the customer's vehicle after you're done. That's yeah. my only piece of advice. I've even seen a lot of guys taking GoPros and mounting them to the front of a vehicle and looking back on the steering components to uh, to see what was exactly what's moving. And uh, that's another great tool, like I said, just like listening ears. Well, thank you, Justin. And thank you to Summit Racing for sponsoring this. Yeah, um, I thank you again for having me on, Andrew. And if you guys are ever interested in checking out Summit Racing's page, you know, head over to our YouTube page or summitracing.com to see some of the great content we put out there as well. Between, you know, celebrity interviews, tour reviews, and all that kind of fun stuff, we always have something fun going on at summitracing.com and or our YouTube page. So until next time, I appreciate you having me, and uh, I'll see you guys later. Thank you, Justin.